Well, greetings, everyone. My name is Allison Squires. I am the chair of the nursing section of the New York Academy of Medicine, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our event today, uh, where we're highlighting the future of nursing two, charting a path to equity. Uh, it is my great pleasure to have members, uh, all of whom are nurses, who were part of the uh, National Academy of Medicine Future of Nursing uh, Consensus Study, uh, who are participating as part of this panel. And uh, so the panel will be moderated by Toby Bressler and Maria Vizina, uh, both of the Mount Sinai Health Systems, and uh, who are also my section co-chairs. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today, and I would like to uh, pass this over to Dr. Judy Salerno, the president of the New York Academy of Medicine, who will give us a few opening words. Thank you, Allison, and good evening. And thank you all for joining the New York Academy of Medicine's nursing section for a special discussion of the National Academy of Medicine's report on the future of nursing 2020 to 2030, charting a path to health equity. This report is of particular interest to NIAM because health equity is at the center of everything we do. At NIAM, we believe that every individual has deserves to live a healthy life and that it's only attainable when we achieve health equity. This belief informs all of our decisions, the types of programs we build, the research we conduct and how we engage with the community. The more than 2,000 fellows and members of NIAM share this belief, perhaps none more visibly than members of the Academy section on nursing. Nurses are often the first and in many places, the only resource for people who need health care. And you, and I'm speaking to all the nurses out there, but other health professionals who are dialed in, please listen. You provide life-saving treatment, generate groundbreaking research and educate and protect our communities. Every day, you're doing the work that helps bring us a little closer to achieving a more health, equitable health system for all. As nurses, you know that the very serious challenges our healthcare systems have confronted, confronted over the past almost 17 months, hard to believe. This COVID-19 pandemic has tested our limits and exposed deeply ingrained problems that we already knew existed, including inequitable distribution of resources, care, and education. When we reflect on this difficult time and examine the lessons learned, nurses will no doubt play a critical role in demanding change to a system that can and must do better. In 2010, I was proud to serve on the staff of the Institute of Medicine's uh, first report on the future of nursing, leading change, advancing health. From this report, we took away many lessons, chief among them that nurses can and should help lead a transformation of the American healthcare system. Nurses are the largest segment of the American healthcare workforce, and you are integral to creating meaningful and lasting change. However, this work cannot be done by nurses alone. Other disciplines and stakeholders must work alongside you, listen to your unique perspectives, and bring in expertise, your expertise, when seeking to enact change. This new report moves beyond where the recommendations from 2010 led us, further solidifying nurses' roles as leaders and demonstrating the indispensable role you'll play in helping us achieve health equity. In the words of President Victor Zhao of the National Academy of Medicine, nurses are powerful in number and in voice and the world needs their actions now more than ever. So I thank you for being with us today and thank you for the care that you provide to our systems, your patients and to each other. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Allison. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the consensus study report at the National Academy of Medicine, reports are convened by funders who uh, help who provide the resources necessary to uh, fund this report, which in this case was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. 
And the goal of these consensus studies is to convene a national panel of experts from multiple disciplines to address a critical topic and issue uh, relevant to the health of the nation in the case of the National Academy of Medicine. And so as we went through this process, of course, we had pandemic interruptus affecting everything, affecting the entire report. I started on the report as the Distinguished Nurse Scholar at the National Academy of Medicine and passed that responsibility then along to Ashley Darcy Mahoney, who took my place after my fellowship had ended and the report was prolonged in its release thanks to the pandemic. Nonetheless, the pandemic offered us a really unique opportunity to address many of the systemic issues that we know were affecting nurses and nursing practice across the country. And this is every kind of nurse you can think of from licensed practical nurses all the way up to faculty. And so as we move forward and begin our discussion, it is my delight to pass the panel along and the moderation to Dr. Toby Bressler and Dr. Maria Vizina. Thank you, Allison. Um, before we begin the panel, I just want to remind everybody of a few housekeeping issues. Um, please make sure to keep your microphones on mute throughout tonight's program. For our guests who would like to enable closed captioning, please click on the bottom box labeled CC and a live transcript will appear. Um, please feel free to use the chat box both to ask our panelists questions and to add to a lively discussion. Dr. Vizina, I turn it over to you. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. And we're very, very, uh, very happy to host tonight's panel. And it's my pleasure to introduce the first panel speaker, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Regina Cunningham, as you know, is the CEO of the Hospitals University of Pennsylvania. And so just so I'm going to give you an overview of what each speaker will speak, will discuss. They'll introduce themselves to, to all of you with a couple of tidbits about themselves. Um, they will then share with all of you how they got introduced and chosen as a panel member, and then what their role is on that panel. And then each panelist was assigned a question. And uh, we'll read the question for everyone so that you can uh, expect to hear from Regina on this. We asked Regina to speak on the question of, can you share with us some of the themes illustrated in the future of nursing 2020-2030. So Regina, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here, um, to have the opportunity to be part of the panel tonight. And I wanna thank the organizers, Allison and Maria and Toby, and also Judy, really nice to meet you. So um, thank you very much. <clears throat> As Maria mentioned, I currently serve as the Chief Executive Officer for the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, which is located in Inner City Hospital located in West Philadelphia. So I've been in that position for about four and a half years. Um, and prior to that, I was the Senior Vice President and Chief Nurse Executive for the University of Pennsylvania Health System, as well as the Chief Nurse Executive for the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So I, hold the, I held those positions duly. Um, so I've been in executive practice for about 10 years, but for the first three decades of my career, I worked as an oncology nurse, first at the bedside, and then within the cancer research enterprise, and then in cancer nursing administration. And these experiences, I think, really provided me um, you know, with the opportunity to develop a very deep um, and rich knowledge of clinical issues, um, as well as healthcare delivery across the continuum within a pretty complex patient population. So uh, Maria asked us to talk about why we were selected to be part of the committee. And I think, you know, my belief is that it was sort of this combination of very sound clinical knowledge, healthcare service delivery, and executive experience that led to my selection. Um, as a committee member for the National Academy of Medicine Committee that developed the Future of Nursing 2020 to 2030 report that was just released in May. So I was asked to comment on some of the themes as you heard Maria um, before, but to do that, I wanna give you just a little bit of context that I think will be helpful in sort of framing our discussion tonight. And so going back to the beginning, Allison mentioned this briefly before, the committee had originally planned to complete the report by December of 2020, so each of us agreed to a term of two years to participate in this. 
Um, but you know, as we began to uh, understand the impact that COVID-19 was having, you know, and in particular, I think the role that nurses played during COVID-19 in terms of caring for the nation, as well as what the pandemic brought to light, which we've heard a little bit about in terms of health inequities, so the fact that it really laid bare some of the root causes of social determinants of health and the impact that these had in terms of higher incidence of COVID-19 uh, and substantially poorer outcomes, particularly in communities of color. So the committee under the leadership of Dr. Mary Wakefield and Dr. David Williams decided to take a step back and to uh, think about what the potential impact of COVID would be. So we re revisited the statement of task uh, that is outlined in the report to include the impact of COVID. So we extended the commitment of each of the committee members for a period of an additional five months. And then we targeted the release of the report for May of 2021. You know, and I think that that was a really important, obviously a very, very important thing to do. Um, the change really allowed us to infuse the report with a lot of new insights about the work of nurses within the context of a public health emergency, a public health crisis, and about many of the root causes of the health inequities, things like structural racism um, and other factors that really drive many of these issues that we know tremendously affect health outcomes. So, you know, in my opinion, these events and this change allowed the committee to be, I think, a little bit bolder, both in our dialogue in the report as well as in our recommendations. So that I think that's just important sort of contextually. Quite simply, the vision of the committee was to um, achieve health equity in the U.S. really through the strength of nursing capacity, through strengthened nursing capacity, as well as nursing expertise. You know, with, again, underscoring some of the comments that Judy made, our nation can't possibly thrive until every person, no matter where they live, who they are, how much money they make, um, can live the healthiest possible life. We need to help people to live their healthiest life, and that's always been a central role of nurses and nursing in this country. So we feel like it's a really good fit. So getting into some of the themes that you'll hear about and find in the report, um, obviously starting with health equity, we talk a lot about health equity, what it is, how we define it. We look at the research that demonstrates the disproportionately poor health outcomes in people of color, in the LGBT community, in people with disabilities, those who have lower incomes, and those who live in rural areas. So that really is thematic and sets the stage for why this is such a critical issue in the country. We certainly talk a lot, and one of the major themes obviously is the role that social determinants of health play in health equity. So the environments where people you know, live, learn, work, play, and age that influence their health outcomes. We know that a lot more than healthcare interventions influence health outcomes. So things like housing, things like reliable transportation, income and wealth, employment status, food security, and public safety, just to name a few. So there's a lot about the social determinants of health and models that we can use to really think about them and begin to think about how we can help nurses to really address these uh, in a more systematic and meaningful way. So racism is another theme within the report. So we talk uh, about structural racism, cultural racism and discrimination. And uh, we talk about them really as root causes of many of the health inequities that we see. And we call out the need to dismantle racism. Uh, and we also speak about racism within nursing, within the profession of nursing, both within nursing practice and within nursing education. And you know, in many respects, nursing uh, as a profession, as a group has been complicit uh, with regard to the racism that exists. And so we need to really address these issues in a meaningful way. So themes around how we can think about doing this um, are important. Certainly, I think we all realize we're at an inflection point in this country and we knew, need to use this time, this point in time as a catalyst for change. Another theme is nurses and the role of nurses um, and the potential power of nurses in really driving effective change in this space. You know, we talk about the workforce, there's a lot of information in there. It's a you know group four million strong, 
And nurses are pervasive, you know, in the healthcare, as Judy mentioned in her comments, they're everywhere. They work in every setting, not just traditional settings like we think of hospitals, but everywhere. Nurses are in community settings, they're in parishes, they're in prisons, they're in schools, they're in Fortune 500 companies, they run healthcare systems and they run government organizations. They're really everywhere when we think about uh, the presence of nursing. So in our research, you know, we had the opportunity to see nurses working in many of these different settings. Our research as a committee involved not only reviews of literature and reviews of research findings, but it also involved field research, field research direct observational research, where we traveled to different cities in the country and uh, had the opportunity to talk with nurses and see programs that they were running very inspirational kinds of, of programs, doing inspirational and incredible work to address social determinants of health and health equity. So, you know, the power of nurses. And I think we all know that nurses have a very rich tradition of looking at people holistically and understanding and addressing social needs. Um, and so, you know, nurses have understand sort of the contextual factors that influence people's health. So that was another important theme. Leadership was an, a critical theme of the report. Um, the need, I think, for enlightened leaders to bring this vision forward. Um, the need to break through sort of the very entrenched paradigms that currently exist when we think about healthcare delivery. You know, we need people who see the difference between the world that we know and the world that exists and the world that we deserve to live in, right? And so we need people that have courage to use their voice in a bold manner. We see every nurse as a leader. So um, Allison mentioned, you know, we thought about all different levels of nursing, but every nurse in every setting, no matter where, no matter what level, we see them as uh, people with the potential to help to drive this change. The committee believes that all nurses in all settings have a stake in this work. And we talk about the different kinds of leadership competencies that we think are essential to driving health equity. So that's another sort of thematic area is what is it that nurses need to do? Within leadership, there's a sort of sub-theme about partnerships and the importance of cross-boundary partnerships um, and cross-sectoral partnerships that are necessary to work in this space effectively. And I think that um, while the work is different and the partners might be different, the skills that nurses have in terms of collaboration and communication are definitely transferable into this context. And so we talk a little bit about that uh, in different ways. I mean, I think in many ways, leadership is somewhat of a sine qua non with regard to this. I mean, none of the recommendations that we make in the report can possibly be brought to fruition without nursing leadership and strong nursing leaders. Need to hear. So uh, another theme that we uh, talk about a lot is valuing nursing. So how do we ensure that the contributions of nursing are recognized in meaningful ways? So, you know, the pandemic has certainly shined a light on the work of nurses but it's not enough just to thank nurses and to recognize nurses. It, it has to happen in more meaningful ways. And so we talk about different payment mechanisms, reforming both fee-for-service payments and value-based payments, um, uh, you know, and providing sort of advanced payment models to recognize and pay for some of the work that nurses are doing, team-based work and coordination work and things that nurses are doing in other settings. Well-being is another key theme. So we all know that you can't give what you don't have. And we focus uh, on the critical importance of nurse well-being, particularly coming out of the pandemic. So, you know, what is the impact of the pandemic on nursing? Um, the pandemic exacerbated issues. We know that issues of nursing well-being were certainly uh, prevalent um, perhaps not paid as much, not actually not paid as much attention to as we need to, but the pandemic didn't cause these issues, but it exacerbated them. So um, if we're asking nurses to take on advancing health equity, we need to ensure that they have adequate support. So themes of well-being and how we can look at well-being and how we can implement evidence-based interventions that will support well-being within organizations and beyond is really important. The need to increase diversity in nursing is another theme. So what does the workforce look like and how does that reflect the current population? And I think that, you know, we when we look at the demographics, we know that nursing is still largely white and largely female. And although we've made progress over the past 20 years, it hasn't been fast enough or far enough. And so what do we need to do? How do we need to start that conversation? What are some of the things that we need to be doing differently in terms of diversity? 
and inclusion and recruitment and when does that need to start uh, and how do we how do we focus this one particular area again a sub theme within the diversity is around the leadership and diversity in nursing leadership and the lack thereof so some of the discussion is about some specific things that we could do around uh, around that issue Another one of the themes is about preparing nurses to better understand and tackle the issues of social determinants of health and health equity. So, you know, part of this is about supporting nurses in doing this. We know from survey research that we reviewed that nurses want this information, that nurses feel they could take better care uh, of their communities and patients that they're serving in different settings if they had more information about this. So what are some of the things that we need to do? We address uh, many different uh, many different areas in terms of education and curriculum and clinical experiences and things of that nature about how we can better prepare nurses. Um, another theme is in the barriers and what barriers exist that uh, encumber nurses from doing, from working at the top of their license, from doing some of the things that we need them to do in order to advance health equity. So what are some of the actions and who are some of the actors that need to um, that, that need to be involved in sort of transforming and permanently uh, eradicating some of the barriers that exist. So scope of practice regulations, but not only those institutional barriers as well. And how do we advance uh, that agenda? And then, um, you know, the, the last thing that I'll mention in terms of many other themes, of course, in the book, but these are some of the highlights. But the last thing that I'll mention is really the power of the collective. And again, this gets back to the 4 million nurses moving in the same direction around health equity. And you know, it's an incredible, powerful, and inspiring thing for us to think about. But the challenge is really about the actions and how we move uh, the, you know, the inspiring work and the, the evidence in the report into Regina, you're still on mute. Was I on mute? How long have I been on mute? Just a minute. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. Um, so, yeah, that's okay. In class? Oh, yeah, class. Okay. So, that I think uh, then I, I'm finishing. I'm closing up, Maria, yes. on my themes. There's many others, but those are the key highlights that I wanted to provide for you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regina. Some excellent uh, themes, and we appreciate your wisdom and expertise in sharing that with us. Um, we're going to turn it over now to Vicki Tiazzi, who's going to share with us um, about Vicki. Can you please describe your role in the National Academy of Medicine's work for the future of nursing 2020-2030? Hi, absolutely. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, special thanks to the New York Academy of Medicine and the nursing section for hosting this event and elevating the visibility of this report. Uh, it was certainly my honor and privilege to represent nursing specifically uh, with technology and nursing informatics expertise um, on this report. Um, so before uh, diving into some uh, details on the informatics side. I'll comment briefly on my experience um, leading into the report to serve as context for uh, answering the question. Um, so about 10 years ago, and some of you might have uh, participated in this, there was the New York City Digital Health Accelerator Program. It's now called the New York Digital Health Innovation Lab. Um, and it was formed with the idea of bringing healthcare startups into New York City and having them be mentored by area hospitals. Um, so as the Director of Informa Informatics Strategy at New York Presbyterian Hospital, I served as our hospital's mentor and had a keen interest uh, in piloting mobile health technologies within our Washington Heights and Inwood patient populations. Uh, two solutions in particular stood out. Um, one was uh, collecting medication data in the homes of our uh, Win for Health patients, was, which uh, was a community-based initiative using healthcare, I'm sorry, uh, community health workers. Um, and they used a mobile app called Actual Meds uh, to enter data on adherence. Um, we brought these data back to our nurse practitioners in the clinics. And um, it was really uh, impressive, the, the number of 
um, interactions that were caught in advance. Um, and then the other solution was through a program uh, called Noom Health and their module, which presents the National Diabetes Prevention Program um, via a mobile app, uh, presenting content and the ability to uh, text uh, and phone with a health coach. Um, we offered this to diabetic patients, pre-diabetic patients in our outpatient clinics in Washington Heights. And we were just amazed by the response of the patients that only that not only wanted the app, but really engaged with it throughout the program. Um, both of these feasibility studies are published. Um, and the reason why I wanted to share these two examples with you is that I know there is great potential um, in technology intervention equity, um, but we really need to gather evidence, share findings, um, and moreover, include the use of community generated and patient generated health data in our nursing practice. Um, so these are concepts that I wanted to infuse into the report discussions. Um, also, I've been a member of HIMSS for many years. I serve as a member on the SDOH task force, I'm a judge in the nurse pitch event and chair the nursing informatics committee. Um, and HIMSS has been a strong advocate for um, nurses as key leaders in developing and designing uh, technology solutions. Um, so given the intersection of my uh, national informatics roles and my experience with technology in diverse populations, you know, I was nominated for the committee. It was then approached regarding my interest in serving, uh, which I gladly said yes. <laughs> so, uh, so now on to the committee and the process, which was just extraordinary. Um, we had a, a diverse uh, interdisciplinary uh, group on the committee. Um, half were nurses, um, others physicians, public health experts, um, all with expertise that was leveraged with that health equity lens. Um, so this really led to many rich discussions and, and healthy debates. Um, the other critical part about this work is that um, our conclusions and recommendations needed to be based on published scientific evidence. And so from a technology and innovation perspective, I found this to be especially challenging, uh, given the fact that a lot of the work that we do in healthcare IT is implemented very quickly and sometimes without the focus of going back to evaluate um, and publish and share our findings. Um, so now I'd like to turn to uh, three takeaways from an informatics and technology perspective. So the first and the biggest uh, is data. Uh, so in order to address health equity, nurses need data. And something I say quite often at work on a regular basis is that you can't change what you can't measure. Um, so SDOH is really a, a big area. Um, so uh, in the report, we talk uh, quite a bit about the collection of social behavioral determinants of health data, social needs data. And it's not only collecting these data, but it's then how do we facilitate the sharing of them across settings, especially when it comes to community-based organizations that might not always be electronic. Um, so the task is to really incorporate these into nursing practice in a meaningful way, utilizing proper visualizations, contextualizations, and really connect it to uh, clinical decision-making. Um, also connected uh, to these uh, data sources um, is thinking about environmental factors. So collecting data on where patients live, spend their time, um, so not only can this support responding to public health issues, but it can also aid in natural disasters or climate change more generally. Um, so there is a chapter in the report dedicated to that. So number two is um, another uh, aspect of data actually, and it's uh, one of the report's messages on paying for nursing care. Um, and this is around the unique nurse identifier. So as we transition to a value-based reimbursement model, nursing documentation in the EHR will increasingly be used to demonstrate nurses' contribution to that value. However, again, very difficult to measure and the nurse's value is sometimes invisible. 
And uh, this is where that unique nurse identifier is critical. So I think it could really be the key to understanding the impact of nursing practice uh, and really enabling nurse characteristics to be looked at alongside patient characteristics uh, within large data sets and across organizations. Um, so being able to measure that impact uh, to look at patient safety, operational efficiencies, clinical effectiveness, you name it. Um, so from my perspective, this is a really big message in the report that has the potential to make a huge difference. Um, and the third area that I'd like to mention today is the use of technology. Um, so the report covers this from a number of different fronts. Um, so there is the use of telehealth, which encompasses not only telemedicine visits, but remote patient monitoring um, and other forms of digital technology um, to allow nurses to practice at the top of their license. Uh, not only that, um, using uh, telehealth to increase patient access and um, having nurses project that caring relationship through technology. So I think there are a lot of action items for us here. And uh, then there is using technology for the analysis of large data sets. Um, so to really help us in detecting and tracking disease trends and identifying those disparities, um, finding patterns of correlation. Um, and then uh, last but not least connected to technology, the report also emphasizes that nurses um, can not only use technology, but constructively inform the design and development of new technologies. So I think there is a lot of room here for nurses to participate uh, in those processes so that technologies are free of bias and can really augment nursing processes rather than create additional burdens. Uh, so these three areas I mentioned, so our data collection, the unique nurse identifier, and the use of technology um, are all throughout the report chapters. Um, and uh, I also want to stress that these must all be considered juxtaposed the technological, technological stress uh, in the workplace related uh, to the well being of the nursing uh, workforce, um, as was mentioned. And we have an entire chapter dedicated uh, to that well being. Um, so as we continue to advance uh, technology, we really need a significant redesign of clinical documentation um, and take a close look at our clinical alerts and alarms. This must be a really measured approach um, as we continue to investigate the effects of uh, new data sources and mobile health technologies um, on nursing well being. Um, so ultimately, this brings us to recommendation number six. Uh, so if you get a chance to look at the recommendations, that one is specifically geared towards informatics and technology. Um, so it's that we are incorporating nursing expertise um, in designing, generating, analyzing, and applying data to support initiatives focused on SDOH and health equity. Um, so there are also five sub recommendations there. And, um, you know, I think moving forward, uh, specifically our nursing informatics organizations will be looking closely um, at these sub recommendations uh, to ensure we're covering those three areas that I just mentioned. Um, as a final thought, um, this report synthesizes uh, the evidence and provides the recommendations. And so now it's really time for the collective us to really take it and run with it. Um, the first report had one very small mention of the use of EHR. So remember this was back um, in uh, 2010. Um, so I am just thrilled that this report calls for the use of data information and technology um, to really get us to an equitable, healthy future for all. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Ashley Darcy Mahoney. She will speak to us on the specific question, can you describe the substantive differences between the 2010 Future of Nursing report and the 2020-2030 Future of Nursing publications? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. 
My name is Ashley Darcy Mahoney, and I'm an associate professor of nursing at George Washington University. And by clinical training, I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner. This year, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of serving at the National Academy of Medicine as the nurse scholar in residence. And so as Allison mentioned in that role, I've been able to help staff this Future of Nursing Report consensus study, um, among other things that I've been involved in. And so sort of my role here um, is to give you a little bit of background of a historical perspective of what has happened over the past decade uh, many of my colleagues are telling you what we hope to happen in the future decade, but I'm going to try and give you a sense of how to link those two together. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful that I can do justice to that. Um, in my specific program of research, I look at neurodevelopmental disorders and neurodevelopmental outcomes in high-risk babies um, and high-risk kids. So I'm just thrilled to actually have seen this report have um, some pediatric focus in it as well. Um, sort of like Vicki, I was really thrilled to have that be part of this. So in re with respect to the question about sort of linking the, the last report to this one, um, just a little bit by way of background again, because of the potential impact is so great, the NAM consensus studies are produced through a special process designed to ensure their authority and objectivity. And Regina sort of mentioned a bit about this, but the process that informs consensus study generally takes a few years and involves some distinct elements. So it involves public events, which hopefully many of you joined, it included some um, open forums, some Twitter chats, some webinars. It, involves original research and it involves some committee deliberations. So really um, extensive discussions from a committee perspective on, on where the evidence is and how far to take that evidence within the structure of this report. This report, as has mentioned, is the second report, the second major report released by the National Academy of Medicine on the future of nursing. The first report reconceptualized the roles of, nurse, of nurses in transforming the healthcare system. In 2009, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation partnered with uh, the, Institutes of, the Institute of Medicine at that time, now the National Academy of Medicine, to produce the future of nursing, leading change and advancing health. This report or that particular report set the vision for nursing through 2020. And the authoring committee of that report produced a set of recommendations for the field of nursing and provided a blueprint for improving nurse education ensuring that nurses can practice to the full extent of their education and training, providing opportunities for nurses to assume leadership positions and improving data collection for policy makers, uh, policy making and workforce planning. And I'll just give you um, an example. Many of you know of, uh, of some of them, but I'm gonna give one example of something that was important there. To serve and understand the changing needs of the nation, it is critical that the diversity of the nursing workforce reflects our country. And that has not changed in terms of what we um, what is also reflected in this report. But one thing that happened since the last report is that the nursing workforce has, albeit slower than we'd like to see, grown steadily in diversity. So from 2000 to 2018, the proportion of black nurses in the workforce went from 8.8% to 12%. And Hispanic nurses doubled from 3.7% to 7.4%. Again, we're not at population parity, but we've made some progress. Since 2011, the number of graduates from historically underrepresented ethnic and racial groups more than doubled for bachelors of science and nursing programs, tripled for entry level master's programs and doubled for doctorate programs. There is still work to do, no doubt. Their nursing program faculty are overwhelmingly white and female with 17.3% of full-time faculty in nursing schools being from underrepresented groups as of 2018. So that's an example of some of the work that was described in the previous report that needed to get better that also is continued to have that same recommendation in this report as well. Since, since the last report on, on nursing, um, it is clear that we've strengthened some of our education, our advanced practice, we've promoted leadership and increased workforce di diversity as I've just discussed. But nurses can and should do more to build healthy communities for all. And so the, this committee extended that vision for the nursing profession into 2030 in this Future of Nursing Report consensus study. The goals were similar as the experts convened to continue to define a course for the nursing profession while working to create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well being of the United States population in the 21st century. 
The committee examined the lessons learned from the campaign of uh, the future of action camp, the future of nursing campaign for action, as well as the current state of the science and technology to inform their assessment of the capacity of the of the profession to meet the anticipated health and social demands in tw from 2020 to 2030. The nursing community, including many of you, mobilized to strengthen nursing education, advance practice, increase workforce diversity, and promote leadership over the past decade. And we hope that together we can continue to build the capacity of the nursing workforce to expand high quality care for more Americans. And this report builds on those gains that we've made. Importantly, this report serves as an, a guide to the development of the nursing profession with respect to improved access to care, enhanced education that have their origins from the 2010 report and advance new goals to making sure we achieve health equity. Over the next decade, both the nation and the nursing workforce will face dramatic changes. More than a million registered nurses are expected to retire. The country's aging population will become more diverse and healthcare needs will become more complex. And nurses will have to address lingering physical and mental health effects of COVID-19. As the nursing field built its capacity from the 2010 report, we started to ask to what end? And we know that stark health inequities exist in the US and continue to persist. And we have a long history in nursing of tackling some of those social and economic drivers that affect health. Nurses are the largest and most trusted segment of the healthcare workforce. And this report helps to chart a path for the profession to reduce health inequities and improve health and well being using the capacity building from the first report. So I think I'm gonna stop there for this, for the sake of time and just sort of end with the report is, be, is and has been released at a, at a critical time in our nation's history and in nursing. When it's clear that we must dismantle its structural and interpersonal racism to eliminate inequities. Nursing needs to be at the forefront of creating a more fair and just world and we need policy reforms to unleash our full potential. Wow, thank you so much, Ashley. That was excellent. Excellent. Um, and yes, in record time. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over now uh, to Angie. And we've asked Angie to answer this question. Angie, can you identify the roles of nursing primed to promote the discipline in the lens of health equity? Yes. And thank you for the question. And thank you for having me participate in this event tonight. So I would also start with my past nursing experience. I have been a nurse for over 30 years. I started my career at LA County USC Medical Center, a 900 bed acute hospital in Los Angeles County Health System. I began as a staff nurse and was able to grow from a staff nurse to ultimately become the uh, Children's Medical Services Nursing Director at LA County Department of Public Health. LA County Public Department of uh, Public Health cur currently serves 10 million people. Uh, when I was the nursing director, which I'm not currently, I oversaw over 300 nurses. The majority of them were public health nurses in three health programs that are state funded that I would like to quickly uh, describe for you. The first program is California Children's Services that coordinates and pays for medical care and therapy services for children under 21 years of age with certain healthcare needs. In this program, we serve around 50,000 special needs children and it's nurse-led, it's a nurse-led program. The second program is the healthcare program for children in foster care. In this program, we serve 38,000 children. The public health nurses are located in county child welfare service agencies and probation departments to provide public health nurse expertise in meeting the medical, dental, mental, and developmental needs of children in foster care. The nurses um, serve as consultants to the social workers, and the social workers are the uh, primary case managers. The third program is the Child Health, Child Health Disability Prevention Program that provides periodic health assessments and services to low-income children and youth and the public health nurses provide care coordination to assist families with medical appointments, scheduling, transportation, and access to diagnostic and treatment services. 
I also wanted to share that I have served as the National Association of Hispanic Nurses past president. And our mission here is to serve and advance the health of Hispanic communities. And we also help to promote and recruit and retain Hispanic nursing students. As you, as you just heard that we're still at 7.5% um, of all the uh, registered nurses in the United States. And currently I'm actually uh, teach, I'm an adjunct faculty for a pre-licensure and post-licensure uh, uh, nursing program and um, assist with care management at UCI Health. I, um, I was invited by Dr. Susan Hasmiller to serve on this uh, Future of Nursing Consensus Committee, and it was my honor to serve. And um, I believe it was because of my background in, um, in public health and working with uh, diverse communities. So to begin uh, to answer the question, I wanted to also begin by defining health equity. And according to, to NAM, it, it's the state in which everyone has the opportunity to attain their full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or any socially uh, defined circumstance. And so factors like you just heard uh, my colleague um, also speak about the factors like race, ethnicity, income levels, sexual orientation, disabilities, and the conditions where we live predict whether we will suffer from preventable, costly medical conditions, live shorter lives, and have a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So again, um, um, we just heard that in, our, in the next decade, we're gonna face a workforce that's going to be dramatically changed. We're gonna, we expect the retirement of, of about a, a million registered nurses. And um, the country's facing uh, the aging populations becoming more diverse, not just increasing, but also uh, more diverse. So to achieve uh, health equity in the United States, the committee envisioned a major role for the nursing profession in engaging in this very complex work. That includes aligning public health, healthcare, care, social service, and public policies to eliminate health disparity and achieve health equity. So why nurses? So the committee believe that nurses are key because as you uh, just heard, we do represent the largest healthcare profession in the United States at 4 million nurses. We are uh, the most trusted profession for the past uh, 18 years, according to the Gallup poll. And this is because of our proximity to the patients and clients that we serve. Nurses are also educated to consider the individual, family, and community and providing expert care from birth to end of life. And as you keep hearing, nurses are everywhere. We're found in clinics, hospitals, communities, correction facilities at schools, uh, just to name a few of them. And I think what's real important is that our history of nursing is grounded in social justice and community health advocacy. As in nursing school, we're taught that, that the profession of nursing is a science and an art, and that art is the art of caring. In fact, the uh, American Nursing Association's Nursing Code of Ethics ethics has nine principles to provide nursing uh, guidance. And the first one states, the nurse practices with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth, and unique attributions of every person. So nurses provide compassionate care. So for nurses to achieve health equity, we will need all nurses, as you keep hearing, at every level to an, play an important role. And again, this includes our vocational nurses, our registered nurses, public health, community nurses, school nurses, advanced practice nurses, 
educators, research, administrators, we need everyone. Everyone needs to. So with the lens of, of health equity, the roles in nursing, we will need to provide future for it oriented care by using what we what we what we um, using holistic approaches for meeting patients' needs to improve health uh, by leading, training, and supporting multidisciplinary teams and in incorporating social care activities into practice workflow. We need leadership and uh, care management and care coordination. And again, nurses at all levels in all settings need to leverage their own power to help us advance this equity. And uh, many of us can do it by being involved with professional nursing organizations, such as the ANA, AONF, and also ethnic organizations like the National Ethnic Minority Nurses Council, Men in Nursing, the specialty nursing organizations. And these are important, I believe, because this is where um, these organizations lead us in advocacy initiatives, health policy, and research. And um, what I wanted to end with is kind of help paint a picture on a nurse's role in the lens of health equity. So I want to share with you a real life example of, of a patient, but I'm going to leave out all the confidential, confidential identifiable information. But this case is about a, a young woman who became pregnant. She had medical insurance, but her health system did not provide prenatal care. So she had to find her own OB clinic outside of her healthcare system, and it was a complicated, convoluted process. So she started um, prenatal care late. So on her first OB visit, about 14 weeks gestation, she was diagnosed with the missed abortion and started medical treatment and was sent home. And days later, she experienced shortness of breath, chest pain, fever. Her husband stated that he was unclear on where to go for emergency care due to health insurance and actually drove further than was necessary during this final uh, crisis event. The patient died of sepsis at the hospital. So uh, what I envision now is through the lens of health equity, if this patient could have a nurse to assist her in navigating her complicated healthcare system, if the nurse could provide close monitoring and follow-up through care management, person-centered person care with compassionate care and cultural humility. I believe that she may uh, have a very different outcome. And I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we have our last panel speaker, uh, Marcus Henderson. And Marcus is very proud to be representative of the early career nurse. He told us that when we spoke to him. So Marcus, what is your favorite part experience within your involvement in the Future of Nursing 2020-2030 initiative? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the question. Um, and good evening to everyone. And thank you again to the New York Academy of Medicine for hosting this event. Before I get to the question though, I do wanna provide you with a little bit more background about who I am and my career path in nursing as context leading to my role in the Future of Nursing report. Currently, I am a child and adolescent psychiatric mental health nurse in Philadelphia and also serve as a lecturer in the Department of Family and Community Health at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. I attended Penn for my BSN and while at Penn, I was very active in the Student Nurses Association of Pennsylvania and the National Student Nurses Association. I was a member of the SNAP Board of Directors for four years serving as president and also the chair of the Council of State Presidents and director on the NSNA Board of Direct Board. It was from this experience that I was exposed to professional nursing organizations and their importance in promoting personal, professional and leadership development leading to my current role as a director on the American Nurses Association Board. 
For those of you familiar with the first Future of Nursing report, you are also aware of the 50 state action coalitions that mobilized to implement the recommendations of the first report. I was active in the Pennsylvania Action Coalition and the work of the National Campaign for Action as a nursing student when I served as president of the Student Nurses Association. After completing my BSN, I began my career in community public health with $100,000 of funding from the University of Pennsylvania to pilot a nurse-led community health worker program that served men experiencing homelessness in Philadelphia. This work had a profound impact on me as a human being and nurse and it was the beginning of my career grounded in equity and social justice. Working in the shelter, I witnessed firsthand the inequities plaguing our society and how they disproportionately affect underserved and marginalized populations. And subsequently, I was drawn to psychiatric, psychiatric mental health nursing from this experience. I chose to work with children and adolescents because I was hoping to support the provision of care early to prevent adverse outcomes in the long term as to what I was seeing and witnessing in the community. However, I quickly learned that their care is also challenged by the adversities, the social determinants and structural inequities can impose on a child and family and disproportionately children and family of color. During that time, I also pursued my MSN at the university and served in a clinical faculty role teaching undergraduate community health and psychiatric nursing. I have been able to blend my clinical practice, passion for teaching and educational pursuits across all aspects of my professional life. In my faculty role, I've taken students for clinical to public libraries, homeless shelters, public elementary and secondary schools, local recreation centers through our city and various outreach programs to help them gain nursing experience outside of traditional healthcare settings allowing these students to explore the various roles that a nurse can have within the community across various settings. As a matter of fact, I'm proud to report that two of my former students are now pursuing MPH degrees because of their community health nursing clinical experience. And I was fortunate to be there uh, to write their letters of recommendation. Now, how does all this tie into and how is this related to my role in the future of nursing? Well, my background that I've shared with you was the, was the perspective and voice that I brought to the table. The voice of a former student nurse leader, now early career nurse working in the community and in psychiatric care. I brought a critical perspective to the table as we conducted this consensus study. So to answer the question, what was my favorite part and experience uh, with my involvement? First and foremost, like most of my colleagues on the call, it was having the honor and privilege to serve on this committee and engage in a national dialogue about the nursing profession, examining the state of our nation's health and participating in charting a path to achieve health equity through the development of the report's key messages, conclusions and recommendations. Also being able to engage in this dialogue with nurses and healthcare providers and other professionals and individuals from across the nation um, as, mo as many of my colleagues have spoke to through the town halls, site visits, webinars, and the public comment, the hundreds of public comments that we were able to receive and review. It was exciting to witness firsthand and hear about the great work nurses around this country are doing in urban, rural, tribal, and so many other communities to achieve health equity. But we know there is still much work to be done. We all know that discussing the future of nursing is a centuries old conversation that continues to evolve in the response to the ever-changing socio-political context of the time. And we find ourselves once again, having this conversation in the wake of joint pandemics, COVID-19 and racism, and the widespread racial and social injustice that we see across our nation. Throughout the entire reports process, I was fully embraced and valued and included as an equal member of the committee because of the perspective that I brought to the conversation, especially since I had an active clinical practice and faculty role. This blended perspective was key to ensuring that this report spoke to all nurses, regardless of practice and educational preparation. I and many, many of my colleagues wanted this report to be relevant to any nurse. So when any nurse picks up this report, they can see themselves and see how they too can work toward our pursuit, our collective pursuit to achieve health equity. Another important aspect of, of my experience was ensuring that the next generation of nurses was not left out of the conversation. The National Academy of Medicine certainly ensured this perspective was present by my appointment to the committee, but taking that a step further was ensuring that the conversation always considered the next generation, my generation, 
and those behind me for whom this report directly impacts over our entire professional careers. This report calls specific attention to many pressing social and health issues, especially systemic inequity and structural racism, and nursing's role in addressing social determinants, improving population health to, toward advancing health equity. As Regina noted, the committee developed a, a framework to guide the report process, and we identified the evolving trends that many of us have spoken about, changing demographics, technology, evolving in new models of care, public health emergencies, and our attitudes towards racism and equity, all coming together, influencing the future of nursing across all spectrums. And once again, our report, like the 2010 report, is calling for a transformation in the areas of education, practice, policy, research, and leadership to elevate nursing's role in achieving health equity. Nurse graduates today are not adequately prepared to address issues related to social determinants of health, social needs, and population health. The 2018 National Sample Survey of Registered Nurses asked nurses, what additional training would have helped you to do your job better? And what did nurses say? Nurses said that more training in social determinants of health, population health, mental health, complex care, and so many other topics would have helped them to do their jobs better. So to achieve health equity, nurses must have enhanced education and training in these areas, including the impact of racism on health. I was proud to be a staunch supporter and vocal advocate alongside my committee members to address the issues of racism in nursing and in our society and the social injustices within our report and how we could enhance nursing education and training to achieve these goals. So, so my favorite part, as I said before, has been being able to take part in this critical conversation. And with that being said, I would like to leave you with a few key points that were important for me, important to me throughout the report process and now as we move into dissemination and implementation. The first being the importance of experiential learning. The topics of social determinants, social needs, and health equity should not be relegated to one course, but integrated and threaded throughout curriculum. We must move beyond the walls of a hospital and into the community and use the community as our best teacher toward our efforts to achieve health equity. We cannot underestimate the power of experiential learning in the community and non-traditional settings to ensure that we are cultivating a well-rounded workforce, further expanding upon the unique skill set and perspective that we bring to the table. Second, we must reconsider and be intentional about who we invite to the table and who is not at the table. We must ask ourselves what voices are missing and why are they missing? We must think about who we have excluded and ensure they are equitable partners as we move forward. We must always think about the unintended consequences of our decisions. Third, we must ensure that the next generation of nurses, students, early career nurses are invited to the conversation. We can't be a second thought when it comes to shaping the future of nursing and health. Too often we defer to expertise instead of bringing the next generation into the fold and focusing on mentorship to ensure they are the next generation of leaders as all of you on this call today. I have my mentors to thank, some of which from the Student Nurses Association are on this call today for helping me get to where I am today and being able to speak to you about this report. Fourth, Diversity is not the same as equity, and we must not get them confused. We must extend the conversation beyond just diversifying the profession, but also about making our profession equitable and inclusive for all nurses, regardless of that. The nursing profession, as Regina noted, has been complicit in perpetuating racism, discrimination, and bias. While as a profession, we are seen as trusted advocates for health and social justice, we too share the blame for the widespread disparities and inequities that we see impacting our own and our communities. We must engage in critical reflection and examination at all levels, looking inward at our profession to sustain the most outward impact. We must clean our own house and have difficult conversations if we want to forge the right path forward toward a more inclusive and equitable profession. And finally, we must be comfortable with being uncomfortable. In order to embark on the path that the future of nursing report sets out, we must be okay with acknowledging when something is out of our skill set. We must lean on others within our profession and across discipline and sectors 
for their knowledge, lived experience and expertise to achieve the goals of this report. We must break down the silos and we must ground ourselves in equity, social justice and an anti-racist lens. So thank you all for your time and I look forward to the uh, question and answer. Here, that was wonderful. We're oh, applauding, you. excellent, well done. Thank you so much, all of our esteemed panelists. We are going to turn it over to some questions. Our first question is to you, Regina. Um, how do we push health equity by addressing social determinants of health when a majority of our nurses work in an acute care setting? Yeah, thanks, Toby. An excellent question and one that the committee definitely spoke about. Mar uh, Marcus's comments actually highlighted a couple of different things. So let me make two points about that. The first is <clears throat> that even within the context of an acute care setting, there are many things that nurses can do to address social determinants of health. So um, there are, you know, systematic assessments, uh, connections to the community. There are definitely things that nurses in that space can be doing. So I think that, um, you know, the perspective that acute care is not an environment for this to take place um, is not uh, entirely accurate. So, so there are things within that context that make a lot of sense to advancing this agenda. The second point is that we do talk about and think very important um, to begin to move uh, the clinical experiences during the educational years, during the formal education and preparation of, of the nursing profession two settings, it's been very, very heavily driven in the acute care setting, as you note, but into more of the community setting. So one of the things that we know is that the, um, the spaces where nursing students have their clinical experiences do uh, influence their choice of where to go to work when they graduate. And so it's important for us to, as, as Marcus highlighted in his comments, to um, expose students to experiences, not, not just in sort of the, the typical community setting, but in many of these other settings where you can actually experientially understand more about the social determinants of health. Weaving the content into the curriculum in a broad way as a thread throughout the curriculum is important, but those experiential learning learnings that we do as clinical nurses as part of our preparation become a very, very important part of helping nurses to understand these issues contextually and the impact of them. So I think there's work to do that we, there's work we need to do on both fronts, but, but I definitely think the acute care nurses um, do have a role. So I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. I'm happy to add to it as one of the acute care <laughs> nurses on this call. So I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner. Um, and so inherently all the patients I take care of are in the hospital, right? I mean, that's, that's where they're born and that's where they start their lives. And I am consistently talking about not only health equity, but really public health in, inside the neonatal intensive care unit. Quite frankly, a lot of, of neonatal intensive care, for those of you who may or may not know, maternal mortality, infant mortality, and morbidities uh, um, have very distinct health equity concerns within them and the populations that come in and out of the NICUs that I care for. We definitely see differences in the babies that we get on racial lines. And that has bared out in data from the March of Dimes uh, to the CDC, and it is important for us to take a very hard look at. In addition, when I think about the work that I do in the neonatal intensive care units, when I send babies home, right, we, we don't want them to come back through the emergency room. And so how can we make sure that when they go home, the parents are equipped with the education that they need to successfully optimize the outcomes for their babies, whatever that optimal outcome is, depending on the babies that leave us in the NICU, they may be different. Um, and so thinking about making sure um, women and mothers get into um, the WIC system, if that's what they need, to make sure they have a car seat and a safe place for a baby to sleep when they get home, to make sure that they understand that um, you know, they need an environment where there is not smoking, where there is not infestations, so that, that babies with respiratory illness can thrive. These are public health things that we in the ICU acute care places think about all the time. And so whenever I have students sort of tell me they wanna do ICU or NICU or whatever it is, uh, that also means doing public health. And we all are part of that, that job from, from start to finish, um, you know, in, in, across the lifespan. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move to another question. This was uh, uh, directed towards uh, Ashley as well, but others can also comment. For the 17% of nursing faculty consisting of people of color, have you noticed a relationship or connection between a lack of faculty, the percentage of nurses of color who have a doctoral degree, any correlation? I ask because I know many amazing nurses who would make great faculty, but they chose not to pursue it because of the doctoral degree requirement, which makes me think, is there a correlation? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I, I was chatting um, with you in the chat box. The, the the citation that I have is from the AACN, and important to note that that's a full-time faculty, which makes me um, presume, based on the AAC data, that those faculty have doctoral degrees. I'm not sure if all 17%, but probably the vast majority. I will say, I think we can probably pull this data. I don't have it at the tips of my fingers right now, but from the Association, uh, the Organization of Associates Degree Nurses, ODIN, I think you might find very different data, actually, if you looked at the ODIN data compared to AACN data and what we see at the community college level. You may see some faculty members there um, that don't have doctoral degrees, that, that have advanced degrees, but perhaps not doctoral degrees. And um, based on the data we know from community college that have a very diverse student population and it's certainly a more diverse faculty population, um, I, I think you'll find differences among that data. I don't have it at my fingertips, so I don't really want to particularly comment a ton further. Um, I don't know if anyone on this committee that may have that um, knowledge sort of at their fingertips, but I, I'm happy to sort of look offline and think about it. Um, a little bit more. And the and the only thing I would add, not specific to the data point, uh, but just in my experience with working with faculty of color, is it's also about inclusivity. So those that are there are taken as the token diverse faculty member, and then all of a sudden, everything related to health equity, social justice, racism, fill the bucket, is the responsibility of these one or two faculty members. So that's another reason why some of my colleagues don't pursue doctoral degrees and don't want to go into education, because it's not an inclusive and equitable environment for nurse faculty to excel and advance their own scholarship, because we make them the chairs of the health equity, social justice, fill in the blank committee, but then they're not filling out their grants and writing papers and all those other things that are required for tenure and, you know, promotion. So it's also thinking about all of those systems that are even preventing those to even consider careers in education because they hear from their friends and colleagues in that space who say, I'm the token and I'm burnt out and I'm ready to go. Thank you, Marcus, very well said. Um, there's been a lot of chat and dialogue in the chat box about this being a great presentation, but conversation about how to move this from a presentation into actionable items. How do we move this forward? Open to anybody who wants to answer from our esteemed panelists. Anyone can, I can answer? I can start. And I think uh, one point that I had made earlier was that one of the ways that we can implement um, this work is through our organizations. So that we are that so that we all have a uh, shared agenda, that we're not all working through silos like we had spoken about before. In order for us to move forward, we need to uh, make sure that we all know what direction we're going and what are going to be what are going to be our priorities and uh, start setting timelines. That's what uh, one of my thoughts. I would add that I think that um, you know that's that's always the key question. How do you take this to action? We do call in our recommendations. We do call on specific actors to move things forward. However, we don't think that just the publication of the report is going to um, is going to actually make that happen. So I think it's going to be. I I agree, Angie, with what you said. Totally, we, that's within our span of control. What we do in our individual organizations, sort of starting at home, cleaning up our own houses. I think what one of the statements Marcus made. Um, so I, I definitely think we have the ability to do that. 
um, there's a lot of policy change that we call for that will require advocacy. After the first report, there were um, there there were actually um, vehicles that were put in place to help to operationalize some of the recommendations from the report. And I don't know at this juncture of any particular plans to do that. Maybe others on the committee are more aware of that than I am. Um, but you know that was that was a strategy that I think was highly effective following the first report. Um, and so. Um, so I guess you know we'll find out what what the plan is in terms of that or not. But I think at an individual level, there is something all of us can do within our organizations for sure. Yeah, and just to piggyback onto that, I know we've we've definitely heard some people that have said, you know, did we go far enough in this report? Did we not go far enough? And that sort of, I would encourage everyone to take this report, look at where you are, and if you feel like your organization can take health equity farther and move it farther. We all want that. We, we are in no way trying to stop short of what we think our potential could be. Um, but we, you know, this is a consensus report and consensus studies are just that. They are a consensus among a group of people. And so if your organization needs to use this report as sort of leverage to launch further, to launch farther or to launch as a start, that's what we sort of hope that this can do. So I just wanted to sort of say that because I know we've heard that in various um, presentations and talks some of us have given. Yeah, and I would just like to quickly, two seconds reiterate the point that even to, to have all these actions come to fruition and for this vision to be achieved, we have to, have to, have to be intentional about who is at the table and who is leading this work. Because if we don't change the people that are leading the conversation or, or, inc or include those that need to be co-leaders, co-partners in this work, we are going to keep cycling and cycling and cycling in, this, in these issues of social justice and health inequity if we don't reconsider who is at the table and use the community as key partners. Thank you. So I'm going to shift a little bit to another comment. In response to um, Marcus, Marcus's comments about two of his uh, graduates enrolling in an MPH program, isn't it interesting that nursing graduate programs have essentially closed all of their community public health nursing programs on the graduate level, and nurses now need to choose programs in public health? Is there any interest in rethinking those choices? I mean, I, I'll just add, and Allison and I have talked multiple times about this, about the conversation about who teaches nurses. I mean, it's crazy to think that a nurse with a master's in public health can't teach in an undergraduate program because your state board does not allow someone without an MSN to teach that content. So I think there's definitely a lot of regulatory barriers that we need to reconsider. Definitely agree that it's a shame that a lot of schools have closed those graduate programs, but I think the opportunity is to ensure that you know, a nurse that gets an MPH is even more well-rounded because they're being taught by those experts in that field that they're, they're looking to study or specialize in. But we need to ensure that we bring them back into the fold and nursing likes to silo and put barriers up that prevents those nurses who venture out to other disciplines to get advanced education to come back into the fold. And we talk about that in the report. If we wanna achieve these goals, have nurses who understand finance, policy, you know, all the things we've talked about here, we have to consider leaning on interdisciplinary colleagues and nurses who have degrees in other profession, in other disciplines to advance this work. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, we're gonna shift for a moment and ask Vicki a informatics technology question. Um, one of the chats um, was wondering, what about the EHR and, and it being prominent in this um, report? Um, what are your thoughts on creating a national healthcare system of an EHR? Is Vicki there? Okay, I guess not. So let's do the APN question. Okay. All right, so we do have an APN question that we'd like to ask. We're just going to find it right here. Okay, here we go. 
Should we look at APN curricula to focus on community-based populations um, and the population-based specialty care? Angie, do you want to take that one? I mean, I, what, uh, what does PN stand for? I'm sorry. Uh, the Advanced Practice Nurse Curriculum. Should we look at really looking at a, a, a revised or a new curricula for advanced practice nurses to focus on community-based population-based care? You know, we have many that are acute care. We have the family, pediatric, we have primary care, but is this a, a new venture? for advanced practice nursing. Nursing. I like that. I like that idea. I, I, I think that would be great, especially if they focus on, com, on uh, community um, population uh, base um, practice. And, you know, we need leadership there as well. We need leadership there to um, support our nurses that are out in the uh, and uh, we need, a, I think, a better focus to help with um, all this work that we're speaking of, 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 inclu of uh, being inclusive and, and um, supporting our communities of color. And uh, yeah, I like the idea. Yeah. Maria, I would just add to that, um, that in the report, we do call out the need to look at curricula across levels of nursing. So doctoral level curricula, graduate level, undergraduate level, even in community level uh, colleges to incorporate content around social determinants of health. Um, so, so that it's, um, you know, something that people sort of understand more broadly. Uh, at the doctoral level, we also call out the need for nurse scientists at the PhD um, level, not at the DMP level, uh, but at the PhD level, we call on nurse scientists to understand and be able to research questions associated with it to continue to build the evidence base in this space. And I'd also like to um, just comment, we've sort of said this a little bit, and Marcus and Regina both mentioned this as well, is thinking about the APN curriculum as a whole, and how do you infuse this work in community health, health equity, throughout the curriculum. And, and while these subspecialty um, coursework may be really helpful for, in an APN curriculum for those that are specialty, uh, are gonna specialize in public health specifically, but for people like me who are um, pediatrics, neonatal, women's health, think about all the opportunities that we could give students in the community. Think about nurse home visiting, nurse family partnership, where you have a nurse that goes into a home of a first time mom from pregnancy through age two, what that would offer to an advanced practice nurse looking at maternal child health. So there are opportunities that this needs to move and be infused throughout the curriculum in new, innovative, and different ways. And the AACN Essentials and this report, I think, give, I hope, gives schools of nursing the sort of undergirding that or the push over the ledger, I don't know what you want to call it, to really build that capacity of all advanced practice nurses to do this work, um, while perhaps having a subset of those really important, obviously we've seen throughout this pandemic that public health nursing as a specialty is vital, um, but making sure we all have that as well. Great, thank you so much. So and just one, oh, I wanted to say one thing, SDOH, that is a new acronym that we are using now at the Mount Sinai Health System to try to incorporate it into the language of our inpatient nurses. So we're, we're starting somewhere. And, um, and you've just reinforced that need to introduce that concept at all levels, not just in education, but in practice. So we're going to uh, wind this down and Toby is gonna turn it over. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to take a moment and uh, thank everyone for your um, active engagement on the chat, but also um, thank our panelists for taking the time out this evening to speak with us and um, for sharing all of this great expertise. And I feel invigorated to change and advance um, the health of our nation and, and possibly the world. So let's turn it over now to Allison um, for some closing remarks. 
So thank you all. Uh, as you in the audience can see why it was such a pleasure to work with these, work with the members of the committee uh, during, the, during that time and the product that they have produced. It, it was a long haul and it involved many a difficult conversation. And so as you are learning the language of equity, you will make mistakes as you go along. But like learning any language, have patience, you'll get there eventually. And so uh, I hope you'll leave this uh, with an idea of what action will I take either as an individual or as someone working within an organization to try and move the needle forward towards health equity for everyone across the lifespan. So thank you all so much for attending. It was a real pleasure. We had uh, at our peak attendance, well over 110 people, not counting the panel uh, on this. And uh, that's truly a great accomplishment and, uh, and emblematic of the interest in this report. So thank you all very much. And uh, uh, Laura Pronovo will uh, be sending out information about where the recording of this will be posted if you would like to use it um, uh, for your own, or view it again in the future. So thank you all very much for attending. Thank you to the panel. It was wonderful to see you again. And uh, we look forward to inviting you to more nursing section and other NIAM events in the future. Thank you. <laughs>